Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. This is a good verse to be in for the, uh, the week before Easter. We have a picture of the resurrection in Abraham's uh, expression of his faith. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 19. And so remember, uh, as we normally will cover a larger section on the Sunday evening service and then choose out of that section what we'll focus on for the morning. Uh, once we got to Hebrews 11, we decided to uh, go more deliberately and look at each one of these individuals uh, and examine what they have to say to us about faith. They, they all learn something in their life that's very profound and helpful uh, to us, to apply to our lives, maybe they, ha they learned it the hard way, reading it off the page and saying, oh, that makes sense, I'm going to do that. <laughs> then you can learn it the easy way. So that's our desire, is to focus on um, the lessons that they learned. And so we're, we're still looking at Abraham. We, we already talked about him before, and then we talked about his wife, and then we had the passage that kind of was a summary statement of these that came up to this point. And then now we're looking again at Abraham. So verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So good timing, right before Easter, to be uh, talking about the resurrection of a father offering up his only son and fully expecting that since he's the one that all the promises are about, that, that he'll rise from the dead. So, Lord, we pray for help as we consider uh, this amazing story in Abraham's life, these events that are just so profound, hard to really uh, get our minds wrapped around them, that 4,000 years ago, uh, you worked so deliberately and so specifically so directly in this man's life as to paint a picture for us of what would come later. And, and we thank you, Lord, that we have so many prophecies in your word, so many pictures in the Old Testament and, and uh, direct uh, information about this one who would come and be our Savior. And, but Lord, this, the things concerning Abraham and, and how you spoke to him and how you revealed yourself to him, if that was all we had, Lord, it, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's, it's hard to get our mind around it, Lord, how um, profound this is. So we pray you'd speak to us about these events, Lord, but then specifically about uh, Abraham's faith and how it helped him to make a conclusion, how it helped him to calculate that he uh, was able to make a good decision because he was considering all the information available and not just partial information. So speak to us, encourage us, and, and may our Heart just be stirred, Lord, by your word to, to take you seriously and to take what you say seriously, that we would be doers of the word, not hearers only. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have this amazing story of Abraham the patriarch. Abraham lived roughly 2,000 B.C., so we're considering somebody who lived 4,000 years ago. Now, when I think 4,000 years ago, I kind of am a child of the 70s as a kid watching the you know, the late 60s and these cartoons, and, and I think of, you know, Fred Flintstone, as though, as though Abraham lived when people were, you know, different than people are today, as though the world was different, as though uh, they were simpler, or that somehow there was an evolution, and, you know, they were on the process of becoming modern human beings. Well, uh, what we have, according to history, is recorded history, and recorded history kind of begins with the flood in, in all around the world. There, there isn't written or recorded history that predates really Abraham. Uh, we were just on our tour in Israel, and they actually have uncovered one of the gates of a city in the, in the north of Israel that has a, an arch that's made out of uh, clay-fired bricks. And, and it's dated back to about the time of Abraham. But they don't... They don't find civilizations that are older than that anywhere in the world. There was a great flood, the Bible says, so that we're not surprised by that. But recorded history only goes back to a certain time period. 
Babylonian history or the ancient Akkadian empires or you just, any ancient history only goes back to a certain place and it all stops at that place. That's right where the Bible talks about a flood happening. And Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. He was a normal person. He lived in a world that was very similar. He had the same dreams and desires that people in our world have. The world was filled with idolatry and wars like it's filled today. Uh, what we might see today is an increase of those things, like Jesus warned, like birth pangs of a woman. There would be uh, wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, diseases, these different kind of things. But he said, that's not the end. Th those are... Those are things that have always been going on, and we might expect to see them increase. So there might be in some way where our generation coming near to the return of Jesus might be unique. But when you think of just human beings, uh, these people are just, when you read the Bible, these are just people. They're people like we're people. Don't think of them as being so different um, than yourself. So Abraham, living 4,000 years ago, uh, as an older man at 75 years old, God appeared to him and called him from his place to go to a place that he didn't know where he was going. He went. God gave him promises about that place. And then also God gave him promises about uh, his seed. He believed that promise concerning his seed, and God credited it to him righteousness. So Abraham believed what God said about his seed. Abraham would, would be the one who... Uh, would be the father of Jesus, ultimately, that the Savior of the world would come through this man. Uh, the nation of Israel would be his descendants and would come through him. And so uh, Abraham believed specifically a promise about his seed singular. This isn't the promise in Genesis 15. It's not the one that we have in Genesis 22 that we'll look at in a moment uh, about all of the descendants, multiple, multiple, more than the sand of the seashore, more than the stars in the sky, descendants. It was descendant singular. And Abraham believed in that promise concerning that individual, and God imputed righteousness to him, gave him righteousness, credited it to him. So Abraham becomes the father of all who would believe in that one and would be given righteousness. That would be us. We believed in Jesus, and God credited it to us for righteousness. It's the exact same faith as Abraham. So he's a very profound person. He doesn't know all the details of the gospel. He doesn't know what you know about the gospel. We're coming towards Easter. We're going to have a Good Friday service. We're going to talk about the cross. We're going to talk about what happens, Jesus, on the way to the cross. We're going to have communion together. The information that we have about Jesus compared to the information Abraham had about Jesus, we have much more. But Abraham, Abraham had enough. He had enough. He knew that God was making a promise about someone who was coming. He believed in that, and God said, that's enough. You know enough, you believe enough, and he gave him righteousness as a gift. Righteousness that was not earned, righteousness that did not come from adherence to a religious system, righteousness that did not come with his being circumcised or with him offering up Isaac as, as an offering that we're referring to here. This de declaration of righteousness happened seven chapters before uh, Abraham offers up Isaac. So uh, he has this experience and then you know, we've, we've talked about him quite a bit through this, and Sarah as well. They're not the most perfect believers. Uh, they, they're all over the place. You know, they, they try to help God out. Um, they struggle with, with, with completely trusting in God. But they come to this point where now Isaac is grown somewhat, and uh, he's still a young man, though. And we have the account here that Abraham was tested, and he offered up Isaac and so let's go back and read that story in Genesis. Genesis chapter 22. We'll look at it for ourselves. This author's reminding us. He's, he's saying, hey, you know this story, so we're going to go back and look at it. Genesis 22, starting in verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. And then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. 
And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. And so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son... God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And then he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there was, and there, behold, there was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided." So, pretty radical story. There's nothing about the nature and character of God that would make you expect something like this. Uh, Child sacrifice is an abomination. It's condemned in the law of God. God never intimates that he would want anybody to sacrifice uh, another human being. And yet, in this particular case, he asks Abraham to do something that we know is an abomination. It's a very interesting and challenging passage in that sense. It calls into question the character of God. The word tested in verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And, and God asking Abraham to do something that would be so out of character for God, out of character for Abraham, and so challenging. And I've read uh, and, and heard different uh, unbelievers or atheists, you know, kind of animated opposers to the to the faith, and, and, you know, just condemning God for saying something like this. Listen, God can say whatever he wants. He's God. And if you have a beef with that, I'm really sorry. I can't defend him. He's God. He can say and do whatever he wants. Um, Now, he didn't have Abraham sacrifice his son. He actually provided a sacrifice. Actually, an amazing picture of a wonder of wonders when a father takes his only son to a specific place to offer him, it's the exact same place where God the Father sent his son Jesus, carrying the wood, carrying his own cross, and going to a place where, where a father did sacrifice his son for the sins of the world. So if I step back and look from it, I don't have any problem with the character of God. If I zero in on it and I want to find fault with God, well, I'm then find fault with God. That's that, then you can argue with him about that. Um, he can defend himself. Uh, God tested Abraham. Some people have a problem with that concept of testing. And we need to just talk about this for a moment. I want to look at a couple of verses so that we can set this aside and focus more on uh, really the application I want to get to. Um, the way God tests us is for our benefit. In this particular case with Abraham, this is recorded in the scripture. Uh, Abraham we have the phrase, he's taking one for the team, in the sense that Abraham is going to have a position related to all of humanity. His life is going to speak to everybody forever. He's unique. My life isn't going to speak to everybody forever, but this man's life is. And it comes through the testing. There's something about the validity of his faith and his belief in God, his understanding of who God is, that's something that he completely doesn't understand why God would say it or that God would ask him to do it. But there's something implicit in his trust, and he makes a mental calculation that God must know something I don't know. God must have some plan. There must be something about what God wants to do, and he obeys. And and so he becomes an example to us. And this idea of testing in the Scripture, and, and I think we can see it really clearly with him. It might be harder to see in my life, or it might be harder for you to see in your life. But because when we're being tested... Uh, you know, stuff is getting burned up and it's getting cut off and it's, and it's going up in smoke and on all of our insecurities are rising to the surface. And, and usually when I'm being tested, I'm a mess. 
there's, there's usually more bad than good happening. And it's all happening at once. Some chaos gets stirred up, and, and God's removing these impurities. And, and many times with me, it's hard to see how much good is actually there that's actually being refined. The, the verse I'm referring to that kind of describes this is 1 Peter. If you want to turn there, 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to break in your Bible a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Talking about trials, Peter describes them like this. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. But look how he describes it in verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith... So the trials are not going to hurt the genuineness of your faith. What are the trials going to hurt? My selfish ambition. (laughs) My desire to get what I want, when I want, how I want. My desire to have a hot fudge on all my Sundays. My, my desire to, you know, whatever it is that I have a desire, not a various trial. I want to be healthy. I don't want to have weakness. I don't want to have difficulty. I don't want to be confused. I don't want my life messed with. Well, all of that in the trial, well, that's going to that's gonna suffer. What isn't going to suffer in the trial is the genuineness of my faith. Oh, in the, in the difficulty of it. He says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like gold is tested by fire. The gold uh, refiner and the refining process, that person putting the gold through the process knows that mixed with his gold are impurities. And the fire, if he heats the fire up enough, the gold is not going to be hurt by the fire. But what will happen to these alloys that are mixed in there with his gold that are going to ruin his final product? They're going to make make it less valuable. It's going to be less precious. So what the refiner does is he heats up and he heats up and he heats up and then the impurities are revealed and they're consumed and they're burned off. And then working with the gold now, he's removed the junk and, and the gold never was hurt by the fire. But what was hurt by the fire was all the stuff that had to go anyways. So here's this picture for us in our trials. When we're tested, God's looking at me and he says, man, I see something really genuine there. And I say, wait, where? (laughs) I'm not really sure. I'm not sure I'm seeing it. And then into the fire you go. And what, what what are you aware of immediately? The smells of the smoke of what? The impurities. And you go, ah, this is happening, this Oh, no, and, and yeah, when will I ever trust God? And, ah, and all these things are coming up, and they're being consumed by the fire. And what's happening to my faith? My faith's not being hurt at all. My faith has no problem. My faith is fine. Who, the genuine things that are there from God are perfect. They're fine. The fire doesn't hurt them. But what gets hurt? Oh, my flesh, my sin nature, all the corruption that's in there intermingled and intermixed just woven together, and you think, well, there's some good there, and there's a whole bunch of not so much that's good, and then you get a nice trial, and what happens? Some of the impurities are burned off, and they're just not there anymore. You go through a good trial, and you know some things happen to you, don't they? You just are different when you come out of it. And somebody else is, and they say, well, I don't know, and you think, well, you know, it's just, it's done, it's over, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good, I have peace. How can you have peace? And someone next to you might be panicking on your behalf. No, you no need for panic on my behalf. I'm fine. God's going to take care of it. But what comes to the surface when we're being tested? We're being proved. God, the refiner, has these process, refining processes, and it's a testing not for his benefit, but for our benefit. It reveals, it brings things to light, it brings things to the surface. And we need to make a distinction here. Turn to the book right before 1 Peter, James. James chapter 1 Because James talks about trials, and he finishes his section talking about these trials and how it's a testing of our faith and what it produces. He says in verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, is how my version is translating that, but it's the same word as the trial. You're you're blessed when you endure that trial, that difficulty, that challenge. When you've been approved, you will receive the, the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So there's always an end to the trial. The trials, when you're in a trial, and if you came in in a trial today and you came in the middle of it, listen, there's an end to it. And the end of it is praise and glory and honor at the revealing of Jesus Christ. 
That, that fire, it proves what's genuine, and that genuine gives glory to God. But then verse 13, and we have to be, be careful about this because uh, sometimes people uh, are, are, don't always make a clear distinction between testing and being tempted. Because having said what he says up to that point, then verse 13 he says this, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now, we just read about Abraham being tested by God and trials testing our faith. And so there's a testing that God provides, but there's an aspect that we want to be clear about that has to do with temptation. It's two different concepts. Now, sometimes even in the original language, the word test is used for tense. So this is not something you can even actually go to the, word, the original language to the wording of it. You have to look at the context. What is he describing here then? Look what he describes. You're, God doesn't tempt anyone by evil. Verse 14, what's, what's he talking about? Each one is tempted. This kind of temptation or testing. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. So testing and tempting are different, according to James. Testing proves that which is valuable, and it leads to the glory of God. And then there's a temptation that we undergo that's not God doing that. God's not tempting us. God's not, he's not putting us in a situation where, like, let's see if they can handle this sinfulness. Boy, I really set them up today. God doesn't do that. When I'm being tempted, it's me. I'm, I'm being drawn away and enticed by my own lusts. Listen, I, what I found about my own lust is I can be tempted by almost anything. That's how sinful my sin nature is. And I'll give you a perfect example. It might seem silly. It might be easier for us to consider it this way. Fasting. If I decide I'm going to fast, I will be tempted by food I would never want to eat unless I was fasting. <laughs> Once I've decided I'm going to fast, you walk by with something I don't even, I would never choose if I wasn't fasting. I see you eat them. Man, I really would love one of those dogs from Circle K that's been on the rotisserie for six days. <laughs> but when you're fasting and you go get gas and you look at that thing and go, wow, a cheddar cheese dog. Hey, man, I, I wonder how oh, I love one of those. I love that cheese sauce. Squeeze the extra on there. Like, who? what? Did I never, who want? I just put it in my, my engine, you know, like Marvel Miracle Oil, you know. I, I would never want to eat that, but all of a sudden I'm fasting, and what happens with temptation is it's my sin nature. My desire for sin is creating my temptations. It's not God's not tempting anyone. So we want to be careful about this distinction. When, when God's testing Abraham, he's not soliciting Abraham to sin. He's not trying to put Abraham in a position where Abraham's going to fail. He's allowing circumstances, or in Abraham's case, he's actually specifically commanding him into a circumstance that's going to prove his faith. God knows what Abraham's faith is all about. He knows what Abraham's going to do. And Abraham is going to do what God knows he's going to do, and God's going to stop him in the moment, and God's going to present a wonderful picture for all of us of the glory of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years before it happens. I mean, it's amazing what God's going to do because of the genuineness of his faith. But it's a test. It's a revealing. It's a proving. Temptation, well, temptation is when I'm drawn away and enticed by my own lust. And then my lust gives birth to sin. And sin, when it, you know, it appears, then there's death. We want to be careful about this. One more place just to conclude this thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in warning about uh, the choices that were made by the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness and how they turned to different sins and the consequences that came upon them, then uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Paul then says, all these things happened to them as examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So we can be warned by their mistakes. Therefore, verse 12 let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And verse 13, let no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with that temptation will always make a way of escape 
so that you may be able to bear it. So while God might provide times of testing and trial that prove our faith, in a temptation, God's going to show you the exit door. God's actually going to get you out of a temptation. So if you're being tempted, look for God to get you out of it. If you're in a trial, <laughs> look to God. <laughs> he's, he's probably not going to... You know, you're going to go through it for however long you're going to go through it. That there's a difference between a trial or a test that's proving your faith, removing the impurities, and a temptation where you're being solicited to sin. If you find yourself being tempted, start to, Lord, show me, get me out of this, rescue me. God doesn't want you in bondage to sin. He doesn't, you know, sin will be your master and it will ruin your life. It won't listen to you. People that profess, they, well, I want to, I've got freedom. Well, if you use your freedom to serve sin, you will have no freedom. You will give up all your freedom, and you will be in bondage to sin. You'll have less freedom than you had when you thought you didn't have any freedom. You'll be a complete slave of sin. Alcohol will make you its slave. Weed will make you its slave. Relationship will make you like your, your greed. Money will make you a slave. Uh, ambition will make you a slave. I mean, anything, any idol that I make will enslave me. I will, it will become a cruel master and I will lose everything valuable, and it will, it will kill me. So, so when we're being tempted, look for God to get you out. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. God wants to rescue us out of sin. So when you're facing temptation, ask God for the way out. Show, the Lord, get me out of this. This will get me, or it's already gotten me. Get me out of it. I don't want to have this in my life. Look for the escape, but with the trial... You have to endure it. And remember what Jesus, in, this, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, lead us not into temptation. Where Jesus taught us to expect, hey, pray for God to, to lead you away from temptation. So we want to we make a, 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 a clarification there about Abraham. So let's go back to Genesis 22 and just look at this again. Because we're going to consider this as the writer of the Hebrews does. It came to pass in verse 1, it said again, after these things that God tested Abraham. And in chapter 21 is a reiteration of the promise that Isaac is the child of promise. God emphasizes that in chapter 21. He's the kid, he's the one. And even to the point where in verse 2, you'll notice God says, take your son, your only son. Well, doesn't he have Ishmael? Yeah, but God already said Ishmael it's not part of this process. Ishmael, uh, I'll, I'll take care of him. He's going to be a wild man. God actually makes statements about Ishmael's life and actually takes care of Ishmael and his mom uh, supernaturally. Uh, but, but the specific promise is for Abraham and his son Isaac. And God actually says, take your son, your only son, Isaac. So we have a father taking his only son to a specific place. Verse 2 said, uh, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I'll tell you. So the specific place is chosen by God and, and the father is taking his only son and off they go. And when do they find the place? Verse 4, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And then verse Five, he makes the statement at the end, we will come back to you. This is what the writer of the Hebrews is going to make the point, that Abraham, in making this step of obedience, maybe not understanding it, but believing, well, God made a promise about this kid. He doesn't have any kids. He's not married. He's the one. So some miracle is going to happen, something I don't understand. So I'm going to do what God's telling me to do, even though I don't understand it. And, and, it's, and it's really, in a way, outside of the character of God. I really don't understand why God would say this. But he's obedient, and he actually says, we're coming back. Well, how do you know that you're coming back, Abraham? <laughs> you and the boy are coming back? What do you mean, you and the boy are coming back? You're going up there to kill the boy. We're coming back. Because this kid has promises about his life. They can't not come true. Now, Abraham has reason to believe God will keep his promises, Right? The kid himself, he was 100 years old when, when Isaac was born. His wife was 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac. So uh, God had um, already demonstrated himself, so he has reasons to believe this. And 
off they go. And if you'll notice in verse uh, 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. So you have a father with his only son going up to a specific place, and the son is carrying the wood that he's going to be sacrificed on. Does that sound interesting to you? You know, the Bible's written by men, though. You know, because there's, men are so creative that they're able to uh, make up stories and have them never contradict. Forty uh, authors, 1,500-year period over which it was written in three different languages, and not a contradiction. Everything pointing to everything, everything completely weaving together. A father with his only son going to the specific place, Mount Moriah. Now, we know in, that Mount Moriah is the mountain upon which Jerusalem is built. It appear, seems to be a, above the ancient, the old city of David. And if, you, if you're in Israel, uh, it's kind of hard to tell now because they've built up. The old city has been built up and built up and built up. But you can generally see the ravine that's the Kidron and the ravine that's the Valley of Gehenna. And, and that ridge kind of goes up and it keeps going higher and higher. And, and they, uh, David offered the sacrifices uh, when, when the angel was about to destroy Jerusalem and he bought the threshing floor of Ornan, Onan the Jebusite and, and offered sacrifices there. And that's where they built the temple. And, and so, uh, you know, the, they believe the temple's built on that same spot where Abraham offered up Isaac. But I don't, I don't know that they're right because the Bible says Jesus suffered outside the city and he went out to a hill that was just outside the city and on a place of prominence, on a main road going in and out of the city of Jerusalem, Jesus was crucified on a place. So, you know, exactly the spot within, you know, 300 yards, who knows? But it's very interesting, God picked a specific place. It's Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem, Mount Moriah. It's, this is this ancient mountain where Abraham went. God had a spot in mind where this was going to take place. It's very fascinating. Now, Isaac, in verse 7, he's, he's willing, he's a willing sacrifice because he says, and you know, there's part of this where you think, oh, this is where he starts to figure it out. Uh, uh, he said, look, the fire and the wood, where's the lamb? Maybe, you know, kind of like, hey, pops, you know, what do you got in mind? Uh, we're going to go have a sacrifice, and I don't, I'm not pretty much seeing a sacrifice. But then uh, Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. They went on together. And, and you'll notice Isaac submits in verse 9. He's, he's not a small child. He's probably a teenager at this point. And um, Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And so Isaac goes along with it. Okay, Dad. So you have the son willing and trusting the father. And he's going to lay down his life. And of course, thank God, you know, the way the story, you know, God doesn't want him to sacrifice his son, and he stops him, and then um, verse 13, there was a ram caught in a thicket, and Abraham went and took the ram, and then God had provided a substitute. Abraham and Isaac were not, that was not going to be the solution for the sin of the world. Isaac can't die for our sins. God was, God was proving a man's faith and using a man with genuine faith and letting and he, this man with genuine faith is going through a great testing of his faith, but he obeys, believing in the promise of God and in obedience to the promise of God, calculating, well, if God made the promises he made, God must have something uh, that he knows that I don't know and I'm going to obey what God said. And, and through that is this amazing picture 2,000 years before God would give his son. So when the father... When we, our favorite verse, the verse everybody memorizes when they first get saved, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You can preach that message from the life of Abraham singularly. If you only had the story of Abraham, you could preach that message. You could, pre, you could talk about justification by faith. You could talk about faith, the necessary faith in the one that would come. You could talk about a father offering his son. You could talk about the specific place, a willing sacrifice, the three days. I mean, you, could, you can preach the gospel powerfully just with Abraham's life. The, this man believed God, and then God, in, in proving his faith and working in his life, 
paints a picture for the rest of us to demonstrate to us one of the many, many demonstrations, there's many others, one of the many, many demonstrations of the, of the validity of the Word of God, the veracity of the Word of God, that we can trust the Word of God, and that, that salvation is through Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, and that he would rise from the dead. Because Abraham was concluding that God would raise him from the dead. And God provides his sacrifice. And so what do they name the name of the place? Verse 14, Abraham called the name of the place. The Lord will provide, or, or literally, if you were going to be trying to pronounce it in some mishmash of Hebrew, you'd say Jehovah Jireh. The name of God, I am, Yahweh. And then the word for sees before is what it literally is. That God, God's the one who sees, but it can also be translated as provides. Because with God, if he sees, he provides. Now, with you and I, we might see, we may or may not provide. <laughs> you know, we may have limited resources. Boy, we wish we could provide. But you look and you think, well, I don't know how that, that's impossible. Uh, retirement, college uh, education, uh, it's April 15th coming up. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things. Yeah, I see it. Uh, I didn't provide. I mean, you know, we, we have impotence, we have a lack of force. I mean, there's all the reasons for us seeing isn't always providing, but for God, it's interchangeable. You can translate Jehovah Jireh as I am your provider, but literally it's I am the one who sees. God sees everything. He knows everything you're going to go through, whatever testing, whatever difficulty, or even if it's a temptation, whatever. God sees it. God is there for you. He loves you. He's going to provide for you. That's what Abraham calls the name of the place. Tremendous story. Tremendous story. What a picture. A son goes willingly to be offered, carrying the wood. A father takes his only son, the son he loves, and is ready to offer him. And it's a father who's expecting a resurrection. A father believing that this child of promise, he, he can't stay dead. He must rise from the dead because he's the child of promise. So, uh, so many pictures here. And, and let's go back now to the application from Hebrews because we've kind of not got to the point that the Hebrew writer is, is about to make. This story is so significant, though, in related to the idea of testing and then, in particular, the picture and then the revelation of the name of God. Part of his name is, I am your provider. God will provide. God provides what in that context? A sacrifice. God will provide a sacrifice on that mountain. And on this mountain, you'll see the sacrifice God's provided. Abraham told us 2,000 years before Jesus came where to look and what to look for. <laughs> what should we be expecting? We should be expecting God to provide a sacrifice, and where should we expect it? He told us right where to expect it, Mount Moriah. And what did God do? God provided a sacrifice, and where? Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's where, you know. No, that's not where. Elk Grove, California. No, that's not where. A specific location. Where was Jesus crucified? Exactly where you'd expect him to be crucified. The place where a father was offering up his son. And that's where Jesus gave his life for us. So back to our passage. The writer here, remember we're looking at, at what these individuals can teach us about faith. What do they have to say to us about faith? By faith, it says in, back in Hebrews 11, verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who he had received, uh, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. So that's the setting. That's what we've talked about. By faith, he offered him up. But there's a, another key word here that we haven't got to yet, and this is what Abraham would have to say to us. This is a great lesson about faith that Abraham will teach us. And it's the first word in verse 19, if you're reading the New King James, it says, concluding. He made a conclusion. By faith, he did this because he concluded something. By faith, he concluded something. There, there's a reason why he was willing to do this, and it was because he made a mental calculation. By faith, Abraham concluded, or I, I think I titled the message, Faith's Calculations. Faith will help you to make decisions. Faith will help you to calculate things. Abraham concluded. The word translated as concluded is a really strong word in the original language. It means, number one definition, to determine by mathematical process. 
to, and the old English would be to reckon or to calculate. The idea that this is something that can be determined through a rigorous intellectual process. But, and, and mathematics, I think, is a good way to think about it. If you're trying to solve a math problem and you haven't considered all of the pieces of information that are given to you, for example, when you took geometry, remember how much you loved geometry. Some, some people get geometry and some people geometry gets. <laughs> and it doesn't seem to be like a, an intermediate state. Some people, it just works for them and other people, it just works them. And, and when you're trying to prove something uh, and, you, and you say, okay, we've got these angles are equal and these angles add up to 180 degrees, prove that these two lines are parallel lines. And if you're trying to prove something, if you're trying to calculate it, if you're trying to use the mathematical rigor to demonstrate that something is so, and you leave out part of the information, man, you're in trouble, right? One of the things when our kids were learning math that I always try to remind them is that, you know, the math book, all the information is right there in the problem. There's not like some sadistic math author is in the background, <laughs> wait till they get to number seven. <laughs> you know, like I put almost everything in there, but it's not all there. And, and then, you know, they just film the kids suffering and then they watch it and enjoy it. Some of you believe that. Some of you actually think that that's how it is. And it may be true, actually. I mean, I had some math teachers that I think that they really got a lot out of that. Um, this is that kind of a word of mathematical rigor. Faith will help you to be rigorous in your thinking. So that if you're going to try to understand if something is so, or if you're going to try to predict that something's going to be in a certain way, you don't want to do that unless you have all the information. If you try to make a prediction and you don't have all the information, have you done that? Have you made a prediction and you didn't have all the information? Oh, I have many, many times. It's called a big mistake. <laughs> oh, how many times have I thought something was going to be a certain way? I thought I could jump that far. I'm not sure of it. Yeah, no, you couldn't. I didn't think the roof was that high. I mean, think of, think of all the different decisions that you made in your life that were based on a calculation and you left out some information. You're like, yeah, I really didn't calculate the wind <laughs> on, that, on that last move. Well, terrible decisions, right? Um, what about financial decisions? You're going to make an investment. How many of you want to make an investment and take your retirement money that you've set aside and put it into an investment product and you don't know the, all the information? It says, how much information do you not want to know? Like, well, you got a broker says, well, look, there's, there's a couple of things. You don't need to know about them. What are you going to say to that guy? I want to know all of it. I want full disclosure. I want it in writing. I want to see the fine print. You, I'm not putting my money in that unless... You, so well, that's only 1%. I mean, I'm giving you 99% of the information, man. No, 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 no. I want all of it. How can I be expected to make a proper decision without all the information? Faith. By faith, Abraham took this action. He was concluding something. Faith helped him to make a decision. This is extremely important as we try to define faith. Faith is not the opposite of thinking. Many people misunderstand faith or not understanding it or not wanting really to be obedient to what God's telling them to do. They, they'll, they'll, in, they'll create a false uh, definition of faith as, as though if you're going to have faith, then you have to stop thinking. Faith is kind of when you stop thinking and you just kind of go with it. No. Faith means you know what God said about something and you may not understand it, but God said something about it. It's so clear, you don't have any other choice. And while I may not understand what exactly God's going to do, I am perfectly fine believing that he's going to do what he said because he's done it over and over and over again. He's never failed me. And so I'm making a proper decision by faith. Faith is not the opposite of thinking. And neither are faith and thoughtful consideration mutually exclusive. Again, if someone says, well, wait, let me think about it. Well, am I not exercising faith? Well, I have to, let me think about, has God said anything about this? Do I have any reason to believe that God is going to help me if I go this direction? Do I have any reason to believe in the character of God or in anything that God has said or has he made any specific promises? 
before, before I decide, is this really some venture that God wants me to take? For example, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All what things? So he's talking about clothing, and he's talking about food. He's talking about worrying about your life, what your life's made up of in that context, Matthew 6. So Jesus gave me reason to believe that if I put the kingdom of God first, my clothes are going to be taken care of. So guess what, you guys? I don't worry about clothes anymore. God just gives them to me when I need them. Sometimes he provides through my salary. Sometimes he's provided other ways. Uh, my best friend, when I was working at Calvary Chapel, his father-in-law was the CFO for a surf company called Billabong. And Bob Hurley decided he no longer wanted to uh, be a Billabong, you know, the Billabong USA. And so he thought, I'm going to make my own company and call it Hurley. My best friend's dad was a CFO for Hurley. So I had all kinds of clothes for free. And I was a janitor making, you know, six bucks an hour. And all the high school kids, like, where do you get all this? What do you? I get bags of this stuff. <laughs> Mike gives it to Jim, and then Jim gives it to me. I got like double hand me downs. It was great. You know, well, seek first the kingdom of God. I'm not going to worry about clothes. Now, what about getting everything I want, when I want, and how I want it? Well, I don't have that promise. What about if I'm not seeking first the kingdom of God? What if I'm seeking the kingdom of rich? Do I have any promise? No, because probably I'm going to get a trial <laughs> that's going to help me uh, abandon the kingdom of rich and rejoin the kingdom of God. Something God's going to try to get my attention, maybe, through my circumstances. Maybe some of you have been going through circumstances, and the circumstances are designed to get your attention. Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing going down that road? Wake up. Come to your senses. Why don't you get off that path and get back on the right path where you're supposed to be? So trials will come, but I can't say, well, God's going to just do it. Well, do I have a specific promise? Or don't I have a specific promise? But if I do, faith then is necessary for me to make a proper decision. And making a decision when you don't have all the information can be catastrophic. When you decide that, well, you know, I think that I, think that I can make it on my snowboard. I can't quite see over the cornice. I'm pretty sure I can make it. Well, that could be catastrophic. As you go over the lip and you, draw, and you go, oh, look, it's rocks. Man, I thought this was going to be covered with snow. We've had all this snowfall. And it's over. I need... I need to have all the information, and all the information has everything to do with what has God said. If I'm making decisions and I'm not considering what God has said, well, then I'm leaving out the most important factor. So I want to um, give you four steps to take. Step number one. Step number one, do you know the promises of God? Do you know what God has said? Because that would, that would be the first thing. If you don't know what God has said, that would be like trying to uh, say, well, I'm going to prove that these lines are parallel. Well, have you looked at the givens? Have you looked at what they told you? you know, what, well, I don't need any of that junk. I'll just show you right now. I'll get my ruler out and I'll, you know, like, well, that, that's not how you have, that's not rigorous. That's not thoughtful. That's not making a careful consideration. Faith means, you, first step is you have to have heard what God said. This is why it's so important for you individually your personal responsibility is to be a student of the word yourself. I can only do so much for you. And, and I, as a pastor of this congregation, it's my commitment to teach the word of God. Every verse in the Bible. We start in Genesis, we go all the way to Revelation. When we finish, we want to start over. I have a responsibility to you to teach you the word of God, to help you to understand the word of God, to model for you how to read the word of God and understand it so you can read it for yourself. But your responsibility is daily to seek out God in his word, to be a student of the word yourself. That's your responsibility. If you're not doing that, you're not taking step one. It's going to be very difficult for you to put into practice what Abraham's telling us. You want to be used by God. You want to see God working in your life. You have to know what God says. And really, to be perfectly honest, Sunday's not enough. That's why we have Wednesday night. That's why we have Sunday night. But Sunday night, Wednesday night, that's not enough. Listen, I don't just read my Bible for the Bible studies. I'm in, I'm in the Kings right now. In my devotions, I read the Bible every day and not in a passage that I'm teaching. I read somewhere else. I want to hear from God, and I've been really hearing from God about Solomon's life. God's been speaking to me personally and, and challenging me and warning me, and I'm trying to take it seriously. 
Because Sunday, Wednesday, that's not enough. I've got to hear from God. So step one is, do you know the promises of God? Are you hearing from God? I want you to look at a passage in Romans chapter 8, or chapter 10, Romans 10. This is about the gospel, and I suppose this is a good place to start because it's easy to see related to the gospel. Romans chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 9. It says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's a pretty wonderful promise. That might be news to somebody here. Here's some good news for you. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you can be saved. That's a good promise. Now you might say, I don't think I could be saved. Well, here's what the Bible says. You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Are you willing to let Jesus be the Lord of your life? Are you done being your own Lord? Are you done messing up your life? Are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to repent and turn from your sin and, and give your life to God and say, Jesus, be my Lord? And, and if you're ready to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. Well, that's a great promise, isn't it? He says in verse 10, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So there's another promise. There's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's another promise. Then look at verse 14. Here's the process. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? If you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. But how can they call upon him if they've never believed in him? And, he says, how shall they believe in him of whom they not heard? He's getting into the practical nuts and bolts process of this. This is the promise, but how are you going to experience the benefit of the promise if you've never even heard? So if you're here, you just heard. You heard that you could be saved. You heard that you could confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Are you, do you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life? Do you want to be saved? Well, this is how you do it. You make Jesus Lord of your life. You confess him as Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Believe and you can be saved. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You're saved. That's what Paul's saying. But if you don't hear, how can you believe? And that, that's a powerful statement. So if you're here and you're a Christian, you say, well, I don't know, I don't read the Bible that much. How are you going to know the promises of God if you don't read the Bible that much? I don't know the promises. I'm bankrupt. <laughs> I got five bucks in my ATM and I just, you know, charged a $40 charge of faith. I got, no, I got nothing and my, my faith checks are bouncing. Well, man, how are you going to believe unless you hear? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Okay? Read it. Read it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. Get to know the scriptures. Seek God through his word. Ask him, Lord, is there some promise for me? Is there something you want to tell me? Is there some direction you want to give me? And let God speak to you. The first step is hearing. What have you heard about God? What have you heard about him? Is it true? <laughs> How would you know if it's true? Listen, I mean, I've got the same social media access that you do, the same media accounts, the same television that you have. I mean, you know, the world is saying all kinds of stuff about God. Is it accurate? Is it true? How will I know? I got to hear. The first step is to hear. And this is a way we can minister to one another. This is the best way for you to be a good friend to your friends is remind people of what God said. That means you need to know what God said. Remind your friends. When you, you're with somebody and they're troubled, remind them. Say, you know what? That reminds me of something that God said. You remind your friends what God said. What a blessing to have Christian friends that are going to remind you what God said. And you start to, like, you know, you're making your mathematical rigorous analysis and, it's, and you're about to panic. And then someone says, wait a minute, you forgot this component. Remember, God said this. And you go, oh, yeah, well, that's a game changer right there. Thank you for reminding me. Step number two, believe in the promises of God. So step one, do you know the promises of God? Step two, <laughs> believe them. Believe them. And I mean a legitimate promise of God, not a man-made promise. And I wish I didn't have to make this caution, but it's an epidemic that we have of false teaching in the country and across the world that 
Uh, you can kind of create your own promises or you can dictate to God what the promises are. I'm talking about a legitimate promise of God. What did God actually say? What, what is his promise? But having said that, God's, God's given us so much hope in so many situations through his word. My, Paul said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Everything I need is going to be provided by God. Not everything I want. And some things that I think that I need apparently are wants because God didn't provide for them. And sometimes that's part of the trial, right? You're in the difficulty and your faith is being proved and you think, Lord, I know this is a need. I've got your promise. And, and you're going through that difficult season and you're, you're, the fire is refining your faith and your faith is being purified and the impurities are being burned up. But a legitimate promise of God, God will never fail. He always keeps his promises. He's never failed, ever, and he never will. So believe in the promises of God. Are you in a situation and God's word has spoken to it? Well, stick with the word of God. I don't know how it's going to happen. But man, the kid probably will rise from the dead. <laughs> and that's what Abraham says. He concluded God's going to raise him from the dead. Number three, step number three. Make a decision then based upon all that information that's available. Perhaps God is going to do something that will make everyone's ears tingle. 1 Samuel 3.11, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. So you have, a, you have warrant to expect that God might perhaps do something in a way that when it unfolds, people will go, Man, that's crazy. What happened? Samuel is in a corrupt situation. He has no power he, he's, he's sort of dropped off at the temple by his mom. He's this child of promise. Eli's the priest. He's got the power. His sons are wicked. They've corrupted the, the religious life of the nation. And here's this little kid right in the middle of it. And God said, I'm doing something. I'm going to take out Eli. I'm going to take out his wicked kid. Samuel doesn't have to do anything. He's just got a crazy promise. But when I do this, it's, if everybody knew this, their ears would tingle. They would say, what, what was that? God might want to do something that will make everyone's ears tingle. Perhaps God is going to do something that we wouldn't believe if he told us. I've had that happen many times. God just kind of left me out of the loop so I wouldn't be a hindrance. <laughs> Has that happened to you before? Or you just, God says, you know, you don't, you're not in the need to know group. <laughs> Habakkuk 1.5. God said, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. So perhaps God's going to do something that we wouldn't believe even if he told us. Perhaps God's going to do something that we don't see or that we can't comprehend. Like what Abraham thought, our passage in Genesis 22. He concluded that God would raise him from the dead. He, he thought, well, no one gets raised from that. I mean, how is that possible? But this kid, there's a promise. He's going to have kids. I can't kill him. It's impossible. I mean, if I killed him, he would live. I, the promise of God is not going to be nullified. Perhaps God's going to do something that we don't see. Or perhaps God's ways are above our ways. The great passage that you know by heart, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, when we make a decision based upon all the information, now we've just aligned ourselves with things that only God could do. And we've done it by faith. We've done it according to the word of God. God's spoken. He's given us promises. We've been in a situation. We've seen the promise. We've sensed what God's wanting to do. We decided we're going to believe what God said. And then the things that make people's ear tingle, the things people wouldn't believe if they were told, the things that are far above our ways, the things that people couldn't comprehend, that I might not even be able to comprehend, God's going to do it some way. And then now we're actually living in that, like Abraham was living in that, and God unfolds his purpose. So the last step then is go for it. Step one, do you know the promises of God? Step two, believe the promises of God. Step three, Make a decision based upon all the information available. And then the last step is, go for it. It's reminding me of a verse in Daniel. And it's, and it's in a pretty intense context of 
the reign of the Antichrist on the earth, his wickedness kind of foreshadowed in the wickedness of this ruler of the, uh, of the division of the Greek empire after Alexander's death. And it's, it's this verse in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, and it's just a short little reference in the second half of the verse. It says, but the people who know their God shall do great exploits. The great exploits is in italics because it's not actually there in the original language. And, and the, the action verb there, they, that they shall do, I think some of the other translations, if you have a different translation, might say they, they will take action. And it's referring to probably in history, the Maccabean revolt and, and, and some of that. But I think it's also foreshadowing in a time of great wickedness and in a time of great difficulty and great challenge, the people who know their God, they're going to act. And the, the, the reason why they attach the word great exploits is this word is used many times of God in his actions. That God's taken action. And that the people who know God then they're part of the process of what God's doing. How are they part of the process of what God's doing? Because they know what God said. They know what God promised. They know what God's heart is. They, they know what his agenda is. They, they're, they're his dear friends. They know what he's thinking. They know what he has on his heart because they've been listening to him. And so now when they look at a complicated problem, they can use proper mathematical rigor considering all the factors and say, you know what? The game changer here is this promise of God. God said this. And so we don't have any money. <laughs> We're not staffed very well. We're shorthanded. I don't know how we could accomplish this. I don't really think we could have, have even what it takes. Maybe we, were, we got five loaves and two fish. But, you know, God might want to do something that no one's ever thought of. And so I'm just going to camp right there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to put myself in the place where God's working. This is just such an important lesson of faith. Faith calculates. Faith is thoughtful. And it's, and it's thoughtfulness that's based upon the promises and the word of God. So, Father, we pray for help. We thank you, Lord, for uh, revealing yourself to us through your word. We thank you for the, just this amazing story of Abraham offering up Isaac and the conclusion that Abraham made uh, that he would rise from the dead and what a picture of a father giving his son in the very same place where, where there was no command to take away the sword, but actually, Lord, you gave the command, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And that it, it pleased the Lord to bruise him and the Lord would lay upon him the iniquity of us all. And that in the cross of Jesus Christ, with the promise of the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Jesus would lead to salvation for, for anybody who would choose to respond in faith, confess you as Lord, believe in their heart that you rose from the dead. We praise you for that, Lord. We praise you for the completeness and the, the beauty, the wonder of your word and how you've given it to us. We pray, God, for uh, just help to put that into practice. We, we pray that like Abraham, we would be obedient because we've made these conclusions based upon what you said. And so for all of us, Lord, that are, are not understanding um, how to go forward, Lord, remind us of the promises that we have. Remind us of what you said, Lord. And if, if we're unclear about the promises, Lord, bring them to us. And if, if there's a way we're believing some promise that you actually haven't made, clear that up too, Lord. Uh, deliver us from those false promises. We want to believe your word and build our life on it and act upon it. So help us, Lord. And we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that it's a message of salvation and we pray, Lord, that you would speak to, to our hearts, God, to believe the gospel. And if you're here and that's you, I want to give you a chance to respond in faith. Uh, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You can receive Christ. So if you want to pray a prayer right now of making Jesus Lord and confessing with your mouth him as Lord and opening your heart to him, and you pray this prayer with me and you can uh, receive uh, that gift that Jesus promised. So pray and say, Jesus, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I give you everything. I surrender all to you. I ask you to forgive me for all my sins. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I, I'm done living for myself, and I want to live for you. So make me a new person, a new creation 
Make me born again. We thank you, Lord, for simple prayers. They're brief, but Lord, you see the heart. Thank you, Lord, that anybody who ever prays a prayer like that from their heart, you hear it always and you answer it, that prayer for eternal life. And God, that you would be the author and finisher of their faith, of establishing them and helping them to grow spiritually. So do a work, Lord, and we pray that you would bless anybody who, who prayed that prayer and fulfill that in their lives, Lord. Do what only you could do. We thank you, Jesus, for all you're doing in our lives. We pray you'd help us, Lord, to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.